You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. This episode is presented to you by Purina Pro Plan and Boss Shot Shells. Dog people, I mean, we tend to have a lot of our identity and a lot of emotion tied up in the things that we're doing with these dogs. So I think that's why sometimes these arrangements can, can really be hard to manage. And it is a fine line between making sure that you have enough detail in your agreement, that everybody understands it and it's clear what the arrangement is, and have so much detail that it just feels onerous to the buyer. And then either they kind of resent it or they just throw their hands up once they get the dog home and go, eh, whatever, you know, and just kind of toss the contract in a drawer and never look at it again. And that's not what you want either. So I think there is a fine line there. I firmly believe that contracts have a place because, as I said, not only if you're willing, can you enforce it, but also it does it does help set those shared expectations. So in general, I think it does a lot more good than harm. Hey all, I apologize for not having an episode out last week, but I sincerely appreciate those of you that reached out to check in and see what was up because, as you know, I haven't missed a Tuesday publish of an episode since I started this podcast last April. So, truth is, I had COVID last week and it kicked my butt. Yep. I'm vaccinated, I had the Moderna back in April, but myself and several others also vaccinated that were there at the event in Houston a couple weeks ago still picked it up. No, I don't know which variant it is because they don't test for that, but anyhow, my antibodies are rocking hardcore now and I am back on the schedule for life. So... Uh, Friday, August 20th, I will be starting a super fun giveaway that I'm calling the 12 days of hunting. Yeah, I'm trying to get out of like singing that portion to save all of your ears and have my (laughs) sponsors do that, but we shall see. Uh, Each day is a chance for a new winner. Sponsors and partners of the podcast are providing this opportunity, so be sure to keep listening each week and watch for details on Instagram as we get on to daily updates of how to get in on the fun and crazy awesome prizes to help you and your bird dogs get prepared for this hunting season. If you're in Doswell, Virginia this coming weekend, be sure to stop by the Purina Pro Plan booth and come visit me and my coworkers and talk about the best nutrition that is available for your dogs. If you guys don't use Purina's Fortiflora probiotic on your dogs, you should be. Fortiflora now comes in a tablet, which I love because you don't need to tear open a sachet for each dog and you don't have to worry about the powder blowing away in the wind when you're adding it to their feed at the end of the day at the dog trailer. Travel, hunting, and training can all bring on loose stools and no one wants to clean that up. So I start adding Fortiflora usually three days before I go on the hunt or I'm going to a field event. I give it every day during that event or during the hunt and then another additional three more days once I get the dogs back home. Uh, I don't use any veterinary medication, no metronidazole because Fortiflora keeps that stool firm. Boss Shot Shells. They will be at the Game Fair in Minnesota August 13th to the 15th and the 20th to the 22nd. Join this community that understands the dangers of lead in the uplands and are tired of crippling birds with steel shot. Shoot Boss's copper-plated bismuth this season. Pattern your shotguns, take ethical shots, and make clean kills. Get your orders in now at BossShotShells.com. If you're a Patreon patron of the podcast, you know all about the Dakota 283 giveaway for a G3 medium kennel and a Dine and Dash. Join on Patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe. I'm drawing on September 1st because I want to be sure that you have your new kennel or Dine and Dash for this hunting season. 
All you need to do is write a rating and review and send me a screenshot. If you can't wait until September 1st for a kennel, be sure to use promo code BIRDDOGBABE for 10% off your entire purchase. The Bird Dog Babe Patreon patrons were also given the first opportunity at the Montana Women's Forest Grouse Hunt Camp that is happening on September 23rd to the 26th. There are only a limited number of spots available, so contact me for more information if you are interested. Join me and the Project Upland community at Wings North in Pine City, Minnesota on August 21st to the 22nd for an instinctual wing shooting camp. You'll receive four hours of instruction from either Kate Onstrom of Virginia Shooting Sports or Tracy Wright of Dark Horse Shooting in Washington with the opportunity to audit the other instructor or attend many of our seminars or demos offered by the Rough Grouse Society, American Woodcock Society, uh, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever. Then there, we're going to have um, NAVDA dog demos so you can see different breeds work in the field and water. And the amazing Simon Teach will be on the grill to discuss bird cleaning, meat care, and meal prep. Sirens, Cesar Garini, and Fab Arm shotguns will all be available for you to use and try out throughout the weekend. My guest today is Jen Amundsen. Jen is an attorney and principal at Amundsen Law Firm in Monona, Wisconsin. Jen brings her many years of legal experiences to all matters affecting you, your companion animals, and any related businesses. The Dog Savvy Lawyer discusses common contract disputes, protecting yourself as a breeder, red flags to be aware of in puppy contracts, health guarantees, microchipping, estate planning, and much more. All right, let's get after it. So I'm anxious and also kind of not anxious to talk about this topic <laughs> of contracts because it's sometimes one of those things that's like, ugh, I really don't want to do this, but it, it needs to happen. So yeah, let's let's get into that a little bit. <laughs> but first, let's talk a little bit about um, who you are. I've known you in the dog community for a while and you're a Wisconsin cheesehead yourself. Yes, uh, we've lived, we moved up here when I started law school and have been here ever since. So that is, uh, well, I guess 20 years this year um, since I started. So, and gosh, you and I have probably known each other going on a decade, maybe just to say hi at the shows and stuff. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Nice. And you're practicing in what area? Are you around Madison? <laughs> yes, I'm um, near Madison. So my office is located in Monona. Um, but I'm really, you know, pretty much can practice from anywhere, can work from anywhere at this point with technology. So um, I have a lot of clients, you know, just in diverse locations. So can you help people all around the U.S. then? Well, that's um, a bit of a gray area. So one one issue that we have in dogs, particularly, I mean, attorney licensing is on a state by state basis. And one issue that we have, particularly with dogs and other pet animals, is um, regulation by the states. So different states have different breeder requirements or puppy lemon laws, things like that. So I'm not necessarily conversant with um, puppy lemon laws or other specific requirements of each state, but I can kind of speak to the issues generally. Okay. So in your practice, you've kind of niched down to the canine in equine legal services. Is that, is that what you'd say? Well, yeah, that's one of my practice areas. Um, I do some business work too, um, with mm -hmm. particularly technology companies, but I would say that the canine and equine practice is kind of a passion project for me. So how did the, I know the dog portion of your life, how did the equine part of it come into that? Um, well, um, so I always wanted a horse. I spent most of my childhood trying to figure out how I could afford to keep a horse in our garage by also um, kind of leveraging my own and my brother's allowance. Um, <laughs> not necessarily <laughs> with my brother's um, agreement, I will add. So that never, <laughs> never came to be. And so several years ago, um, after we moved out here, I started riding again. 
and ended up um, buying a horse. I have an off-the-track thoroughbred who is mostly past his prime now. I don't really ride at this point, um, but he's about 10 minutes from the house, so I get to see him occasionally. Nice. And so, and and so, I mean, it's kind of a companion, right, to the canine work, and I know a lot of people in the equine community locally, um, so that's kind of how that dovetails. The dogs in your life, you now have Clumber Spaniels. We do. When did, when did, when did the bird dogs come into your life? <laughs> well, when we still lived in Chicago before we moved up here, um, I really wanted a dog, but it always came down to, we didn't want to house train a dog in a Chicago winter. So we never got a dog. We were waiting until we had a yard, which we got when we moved up here because I was like, well, now we need to get a dog. So that means we have to have a yard. (laughs) So I had, I had gotten this dog encyclopedia and I found the Clumber Spaniel when I was looking through it. And I just knew that that was the dog for us. Um, so after we moved up here, we first started with a rescue clumber, which there aren't a ton of those available, but we had one. Um, and then uh, when I graduated from law school, our second clumber was supposed to be my graduation present. Um, however, he, in lieu of diamond earrings, by the way, um, <laughs> I was given a choice. Good so Good needless tra- to I like say, that. I selected the dog. Um, but he really turned into Michael's first hunting buddy, uh, was kind of a question of, well, now we have this dog, um, and Wooster needed a job like nobody's business. I mean, he was just, uh, you know, he was a clumber, so he wasn't like ripping around the house, but he really was a smart clumber and liked to get into things and see how they worked. And, you know, we would come home every day and find something else had been taken off the counters and destroyed or eaten or what have you. So he really needed a job. And so Michael really took up hunting after we got the dogs for that purpose. So I'm trying to imagine a clumber jumping up on a counter though. (laughs) Oh, that's their, they counter surf. I mean, almost all of them do. Really? So, like, so their, their length of body can get them up there. Correct. And over the, huh? Okay. Yeah, Rooster could reach the very back of the counter. If he wow. pushed something all the way to the back, he would put one paw on the counter and kind of hold himself in place while he hops and uses his other paw as a hook to pull stuff forward. I mean, forward. you just kind of have to be impressed by that. Like you, you <laughs> can't really get mad at them, right? Like you're like, wow, that's impressive. You go, you well, be bad. Whatever. Yes. I mean, and he never, like you would yell at him and his tail would just be wagging. I mean, he just, he was just unrepentant in his naughtiness. And, you know, you, you don't really think of Clumbers as being terribly athletic, but Wooster really was. And our younger male that we have right now, when we were at dog shows in South Dakota, a couple years ago, we were listening to the national anthem and he jumped from a standing position by my side onto the grooming table during the anthem and the people next to us came over afterwards. I think they had Dobermans or something. And she was like, did that clumber just jump from a standstill? I'm like, yes, he did. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they can be very athletic too. Yeah. Well, and, and I found that like our naughtiest dogs are by far our most driven best dogs in the field. And that's why I always say I always keep the naughty puppy from every litter. Yeah. And I mean, would you correlate that with your clumber compared to the other ones you've had? Well, Wooster, um, Michael's first hunting dog was certainly his best hunting dog to date, kind of probably had the most drive. Um, We have an older female right now that is very smart. She has never been to a hunt test because she's very smart, but she's also not very uh, much of a team player in an off-leash kind of sense. (laughs) Like I'm doing nose work with her and she's really, really good at it, but she doesn't have to like retrieve an object that she has to then give to me. Um, But she's got a lot of drive and she's very naughty. (laughs) Nice. So what kind of hunting does your husband mainly do with them? Um, He does a lot of hunting, you know, mostly I would say on game farms here in the Wisconsin area not a ton of traveling and then AKC hunt mm-hmm. tests um, primarily. Okay. So they're doing pheasant hunting then? Yes. Sorry. Pheasant, okay. Usually pheasant, um, some chucker. Okay. Cool. Like yeah. I'd love to see a picture of a clumber carrying around a big rooster pheasant. Oh, they, they're, they're 
great. I mean, they're a, you know, 70 pound dog male. Right. So they get yeah. pretty good size. They don't have with those big, with yeah, with the big jowls. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's actually funnier to see Wooster, the big dog trying to carry a quail which pretty much just disappeared into his <laughs> right. maw. Right. I like, oh, I hope there's going to be something left. <laughs> so we don't do a lot of quail hunting with them, but. That would be a little slobbered on, wouldn't it? Yeah, there was um, an, some kind of event. I think it was like a UKC hunting retriever kind of event that we did that was close to home um, probably a decade ago now. So we decided to go down there with like 45 minutes and it was kind of a new event and, but they were using quail and that's the okay. one and only time I saw Wooster <laughs> carrying a quail and it, it pretty much just disappeared into his slobbery, slobbery <laughs> jowls. So. I would, I think they'd be like, whoops, I accidentally just swallowed that. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, <laughs> you know, Sylvester when he swallows the Tweety bird. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> my uh, breeder that my, two of my Broncos are from, she just got her, a first clumber puppy and they're the cutest puppies. They, cute, they cute. I have to say they are very cute. Like they look like little white rats when they're born, uh, mm-hmm. especially cause we do tend to keep the tails, but um, as they grow, I mean, when they get to be four or five weeks old, you can't beat them for the cuteness factor. <laughs> and you have a, what do you have? A three day old clumber puppy at home right now? Yeah. We have a little guy who was born on Sunday. Cute. Do you have yes. a name for him yet? Um, well, since he's a singleton pup, um, we are probably going to call him Karma's Small Fortune. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with his call name probably being either Fortune or Chance. It makes sense. <laughs> one of our other dogs um, was sired by a singleton, one of our other clumbers. Um, and the, the sire's name was very expensive. That was his registered name. So I think Michael was keying off that when he suggested Small Fortune. Yeah, quite fitting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping into our contracts, what do you think is like the most common problem that people are coming to you for in terms of dog, what would you say, dog litigation? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I haven't done any um, actual litigation but I mm-hmm. think there just isn't much actual litigation that goes on because let's be honest, in most cases, people are not willing to um, expend the resources that would be involved. Um, okay. But I would say the most common dispute that I see um, are usually over co-ownership. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my experience, I think most disputes, and this would be in the dog world and elsewhere, uh, usually stem from the fact that we don't have shared expectations. So something wasn't put into the contract or it wasn't worded in a way that was clear to both parties. Um, So I like to think of a contract as the way that the parties kind of set their shared expectations. Okay. Yeah. And I call, I call them, I do co-ownerships like that. I call them French friendship preservation agreements. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. But you know, what I find interesting is you, when we've like done a co-ownership on puppies that we've bred, they're super easy. They're very black and white. Mm-hmm. And, but then when you work out an agreement with a friend, <laughs> why is it way more difficult? Why are, why do issues arise there? Well, I think that's because um, people are, I think you're more likely to make the assumption that you have shared expectations Mm-hmm. And so probably maybe don't put things in writing. Um, you know, I've had some contracts where there were things in writing that I thought were absolutely ridiculous. I've reviewed two contracts now just coincidentally from the same breeder um, on behalf of the buyers where the breeder required them to feed a particular type of food that they purchased from her. Oh, I personally think that's ridiculous. I would never sign a contract like that. But these are not dog people, right? These are pet buyers. So they don't Mm -hmm. know any better. And they, you know, they think she's just watching out for them, whatever. And, and, you know, people may have a particular desire to have their dog fed a certain thing. And I think that's fine. But I think it's really difficult to control all those things when a dog goes to a different home. I think there are some things you just have to let go as the breeder. Um, 
And I think if you are selling a dog to a friend, then you're probably selling them a dog because you think that you have a good idea of how they raise their dogs and how they manage their dogs. And you think that, you know, they're going to do things either the way you would do them or you approve of how they do them or, you know, things like that. So you wouldn't be likely to put in, you know, maybe some things you would pay closer attention to if it was somebody that was more of a stranger. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. So as a, as a breeder, like what are a few things that we should be sure are included in our puppy contracts? I think of course, having, having a spay or neuter agreement or, a, or whether or not the dog should go on to, to be a breeding animal. Is yeah. there, is there like a specific way that should be worded or what do you suggest? Um, you know, I think wording can be pretty flexible. Um, I don't necessarily think that everyone has to have a spay or neuter um, contract, but they should have something that details whether the dog is allowed to be bred from or not. And obviously then whether you require a spay or neuter kind of depends on your level of trust Mm -hmm. with the buyer, right? Because that's always a factor in contracts is what the level of trust is. Now, I don't necessarily think if you have no trust in people that you want to be selling them a dog to begin with, but if it is maybe somebody that you are not close with or you don't know well, then that would be a for me, perhaps a triggering factor in whether I sell a puppy on a contract that requires a spay or neuter versus just saying, you know, the dog will not be bred from. And the reason for that is just because, you know, the more um, medical knowledge we get, the more we learn that maybe spay and neuter is not the best thing for the dog long haul. Mm -hmm. Um, So I like to take that into account where I can. I mean, I guess that comes with responsible dog ownership and trusting who you're selling the the puppy to. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Of keeping, keeping them intact for their, for their lifetime, but you know, accidents do happen. Right. So, so I have, you know, in my contract, I have a provision that says that they understand that, um, you know, the breeding of these dogs affects my reputation as the, the kennel, like if, you know, if they have an oops litter with one of my dogs, that dog's pedigree and kennel name is going to be on the puppies, you know, papers, if there are papers or associated with the puppies ever after that. Um, so I have a clause that says that they understand that, you know, they, that may affect my standing within my community and that they may be required to compensate me for any um, reputational injury. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I don't have the specific wording handy, but it's kind of, um, an equitable remedy, I guess, like a, almost like a liquidated damages type provision. Yeah. And, and I guess that could be enough incentive right there just so that they're aware of it, of putting, yeah. putting that in. Nope. And again, I mean, I think that goes to shared expectations. You know, you can sell a dog on a spay or neuter contract, but if they move across the country with that dog and you're not a co-owner and you have no control, I mean, there's no way for you to know, right? Now, I mean, I know people do other things like they hang on to the papers until they get proof of spay or neuter. And if, if you are really, really sure that you want that dog to be spayed or neutered and no ifs, ands, or buts, then that might be the way to do it. Because a contract is only as good as your willingness to enforce it. And as I said, most people don't really want to initiate a lawsuit, <laughs> particularly right. if they had to do so in another state. Um, You know, if you move to the opposite coast and I have to now sue you in, you know, Pacific Northwest somewhere, that's going to be really inconvenient for me and potentially expensive. And is it going to be worth it? So, um, you know, the limitation of contracts of their utility is really how willing are you to enforce it? And, And I think, I mean, that's the limitation from a legal perspective. Again, I think there's a lot of value in using the document to set those shared expectations. And so I I had a friend that um, she's a very good, reputable, responsible breeder and um, dog was sold on a spay neuter agreement uh, and limited registration with AKC, right? So the puppies couldn't even oh. be registered. Which but- is a good option. Right. 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 But they still wanted to breed and sell them unregistered. Um, Actually, I 
think that they were sitting in a parking lot selling them out of a parking lot. So it was devastating for her. Oh, um, yeah. And, you know, what kind of recourse or action can you take with something in that situation where they're breeding it, even knowing that they won't register the puppies? Would you still put that kind of same clause in there that you just mentioned that if it's, that if it's done, this is what is owed back to me? I think I would. Yeah. Um, you know, in that case, it would be, you know, the reputational injury, but potentially like if I were to keep that dog and breed it, how much money would I be getting for the puppies? And I, I realize that's not, you know, one of our primary considerations. Like I don't go, I'm selling you this dog on a spay or neuter contract because I don't want you competing for puppy sales. Right. That's not, that's right. not the purpose of it, but that might be one way um, from a legal perspective, because you have to have damages in order to, to sue somebody, right? If there's no damage, there's no injury, there's no claim, no legal claim. Mm -hmm. And so one thing is to say, like, we agree that if you breach this particular clause, my damages are equal to, you know, the number of litters that you have times the number of puppies or something like that times the, the going rate for a puppy. Okay. Okay. Um, and there, there, that can be tricky drafting those provisions. And that might be, um, you know, there might be sort of state specific law on that. It wouldn't be a statute, but like judge made law, common law, kind of case law um, on liquidated damages. So it can be tricky to draft those because they're not to be a quote unquote penalty. <laughs> and whether mm -hmm. something is liquidated damages or a penalty is largely in the eye of the beholder. Um, I guess I'll say for the ease of simplicity. So okay. um, you may want to have, if you go with that route, you may want to have a lawyer in your state um, try to draft that. That's expensive. I get it. Like nobody hires me to draft puppy contracts because they don't want to pay for it. So that's an expensive thing to do to have a lawyer help you put together contracts. I mean, I, you know, it really depends on the lawyer and, and how they bill, um, you know, what I, what I would love to do is um, create forms that I could sell across the nation, but that's a little bit tricky because of the, the wide variation in law, you know, because if I sell you a contract that I drafted for Wisconsin to meet the requirements of the breeder uh, legislation here, it doesn't necessarily meet the requirements of Texas or Arizona or California. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if you can find a good form um, or find an attorney that has good forms for your state, then that may be a way to get it done for less money. Um, but it, it is, you know, it takes time and a lot of lawyers bill by the hour. So. Right. That gets I, I, I feel like I keep adding things in as I learn them and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over, too. over the course of the last, I don't know, it's been 14 years of, uh, since our first letter. And it's like, I, I, how, I just think, how am I still learning this the hard way? <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like huh. I learn everything the hard way. I'm like, could right. I learn from someone else's bad experience? <laughs> right. for a change? That would be nice. Right. Right. I, and I mean, what's your experience with how, you know, our dog organizations like AKC and NAVDA and, um, you know, the different UKC, like how, how or when are they stepping in or do they try to have, you know, the lawyers work it out? Yeah. So my primary experience there would be with AKC. Um, and I can't say that I've really had any experience where they have been willing to step in. Um, mm -hmm. I've had a couple of disputes that I know my clients have had before AKC um, and they have not gotten any result, unfortunately. Okay. So they just kind of say, deal with it, work it out? Yeah, they seem to, um, and it, it makes sense from AKC's perspective to be hands-off about it. And I think that's how they are um, mm -hmm. about club issues as well, um, unfortunately. You know, but I think they probably don't see much benefit to them in jumping in. But I've had, you know, cases where um, somebody sold a bitch and then trying to think how, how it worked. Well, I had a couple of cases where someone sold a bitch. In one case, um, the buyer 
went on to breed the bitch and then they co-owned a puppy from that litter but there was no contract um but the original breeder felt that you know their their terms from the original sale contract had not been met and akc was not um, of any use there and then uh, similarly i represented a buyer who had signed a contract with her breeder and um that that was similarly the akc was similarly uh, I won't say unresponsive. I mean, they do respond, but they don't respond in a way that resolves the problem. Um, they okay. have now a program that they've put together to encourage people to mediate their disputes. Okay. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. You know, a lot of these disputes, as you well know, are between people who have been longtime acquaintances or friends. And, you know, when I, I don't, I don't actually do any litigation in my practice these days, but when I did litigation and, and even now when I'm counseling clients about whether to engage in litigation, to me, it comes down to one component is going to be the psychic trauma. And if you are suing a friend or someone you considered a friend for many years, um, that's going to be very traumatic. Right. And you're probably, you know, then if it's a small breed, you're going to split the whole breed community. I mean, you know, really can have kind of far reaching repercussions in our community. So um, I don't think that a mediated resolution would be the worst thing. Um, but often by the time it gets to the point where I'm involved, there's so much acrimony that's built up, you know, because the parties have tried to resolve it themselves and it hasn't right. worked. Um, and so now everybody's just ticked off. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so usually um, I, I think, I don't know, at, at that point, I think mediation might be a difficult, um, a difficult path, but it also might be worth trying, you know, if you think there's a chance of salvaging relationships or, or getting a better outcome for yourselves and your dogs versus yes. out and out, you know, dual. As a new owner, as somebody that is inquiring to a breeder, wanting to get a puppy, um, I mean, do you think as the breeder to, to tell, to should give them that contract, like on first contact, do you give them that contract after you've re you know, discovered or gone through your approval process? And at that point you give it to them or what do you think? When, when should the new owner get that yeah, contract and what that puppy's going to come with? That's a great question. I mean, I think you definitely should have the conversation about the contract in broad strokes. So if there is a spay or neuter requirement, if it's going to be a co-ownership, and it makes sense that you would have talked about these things, but I think it's important, as, you know, especially if it's something like a co-ownership where the parties are going to have an ongoing relationship with, with each other and with the dog, then you definitely want to make sure that you have those uh, shared expectations I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't as a rule, share my contract, like on first contact. If someone asked me for it, I probably wouldn't have a problem sharing it. Um, you know, if I thought that they were genuinely interested in a puppy and were just, you know, curious, well, what's the deal going to be in the end? That would be fine with me, I think. Um, I guess these days breeders are a little on edge about who's asking what questions and what are they asking? Um, right. Right. So that, that might play into it, but as a general rule, I don't think there's any reason not to share and be as transparent as possible with your buyers. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that helps develop trust, which I also think is a very important component of a successful contract. What do you think as the, as a new puppy owner, things in the contract that, I mean, is the, do you feel like there's always room for negotiation where you see something, you don't like it, and you ask the breeder if you can change that? I would say um, yes, but with a caveat, you know, um, I've, I've had, well, we've had two litters now, so we've sold, I don't know, somewhere around 10 puppies, let's say. I've had one person ask me to change one thing in my contract. And that's probably because my contract is pretty general. And those are mostly pet contracts. I guess we've had a couple that are co-ownerships. Um, those people, <laughs> those people didn't argue about anything. Actually, it was one of the pet buyers that 
wanted a change. He felt there was a particular provision that was one-sided and he wanted to make it mutual. And that was fine. I didn't have a problem with that. Um, but I would say for, for pet buyers, you know, in the purebred dog community, a lot kind of depends on whether you're a known quantity or whether you're somebody that's new. And that may be unfortunate, but I think it's a, as a practical matter, it's very real. Um, and if you are an unknown person who comes in and wants to buy a puppy and starts asking to make 50 changes to the contract, that breeder probably has other people that they will get in inquiries from that would be, let's say, easier for them to deal with. It's a person they already know. It's somebody who's not asking them to make changes to the contract. So I certainly think you can negotiate, mm -hmm. um, but just depending on your circumstances, it might affect your ability to get a puppy. Right. <laughs> and I can vouch for that because <laughs> <laughs> it's always a good thing when somebody comes to you and, and has already done great things with one of their previous dogs or several of them. And that was this case where he had done some great things, but we, in our contract, it's we keep a co-ownership on them if they're going to be sold on full registration until they've met uh, breeding requirements, which include an AKC show champion title to mm. be chick health tested and earn an advanced field title. And okay. then we sign off, hand over and say, have at it. You know, you've earned this, you've the dog has proven its ability. It's healthy. Great representative of the breed. Go go forward with yourself and make make great things happen in the breed. But um, this person had said they had no no plans of ever breeding. Wanted a female. Um, mm. Already had an intact male at home, <laughs> and had no plans of breeding. But did not want to co own, and did not want to agree to the breeding terms. Mm. So and red flags. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought, well, well, that doesn't make sense. Then if you don't want to breed, why won't you just sign it? And yeah. so um, again, promised to do great things. And I knew it would, you know, help our kennel name to see those great titles on that dog. But like, you just kind of lose my trust right there. So yeah, we did say goodbye. Yeah. I mean, I, I do, you know, I know there's a lot of debate in the purebred dog community about the fact that it can be hard to break in as a new mm. person. Um, and we, we did sell a very nice puppy out of our first litter um, to a single guy who um, had wanted a clumber for a long time and had waited until he thought he was in a good place to get a clumber. And he was ultimately referred to us by another breeder. Um, and he's turned out to be a great owner. I mean, he was willing to drive down, from the twin cities to kind of have a sit down, you know, one-on-one -on -one get to know you with us before we had agreed to sell him a puppy. And then he drove down again <laughs> to pick up the puppy. So he was obviously committed. I mean, he seemed very earnest when we talked to him. And so we were happy to um, help him get his first clumber. Um, but there have been other people that just from the tone of their email, I was like, mm, I wouldn't sell a dog to this person. Right. And, you know, we aren't dealing with, model t's they don't roll off the assembly line there's no you know there's no quality control in that way but on the other hand we put a lot of time and effort into raising them and it's important to us you know as it is important to you that your dogs be treated well and and that they be a credit to the breed and and managed as a credit to the breed and so there can be a lot of gatekeeping and i think trying to negotiate your contract terms as a new buyer um, you know, it depends on what the terms are, right? I mean, the guy that wanted to have a, a term changed or removed out of our contract, I think it was, um, it was a boilerplate kind of term, some sort of, I don't know if it was like a damages provision. And he wanted, you know, if he said, if you have the right to get damages, I want the right to get damages. And I was like, well, that's never going to come up. I don't care. Yeah. Um, so, right. so it wasn't a problem, but if he had said, you know, let's just say I had a spay or neuter in that contract. If he had said, well, we want the right to not spay or neuter, I would have been like, mm, hit the bricks, buddy. I'm, I can find a better home for this puppy or another home for right. this puppy that'll be just as good without the worries for me. So, I mean, that's not a legal 
consideration per se, but I think it is a, a fact. What are some other kind of red flags in in contracts that people should steer away from if they get handed when they're looking to buy a puppy? Like like the one you mentioned earlier of you must feed the food and buy it from me. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think um, if you're the buyer, I would look at the contracts with kind of a jaundiced eye, right? So um, anything where it's you have to feed the puppy this particular diet and buy it from me or the same thing with supplements, right, would be a, a red flag. Um, I guess... I don't see a whole lot of, of contracts that I think are onerous in that way. But as I said, I did see two from this one particular breeder that I was like, wow, I mean, wow, two people in this small area are seeking out an attorney now. And, and actually what they weren't even complaining about the food, but I think if you are buying a dog on a co-ownership, that's where it's probably particularly important to review a contract carefully. Sometimes you will get things like in one case, I had a contract where, um, you know, nice couple had bought a golden puppy, I think it was from somebody. And they had a contract where she wanted the puppy to be shown. And the question was, like, at what point could they stop showing the puppy? The the buyers told me he was small, he was not going to make I guess Goldens must have some kind of a height requirement or a weight requirement or something that's a, if not a DQ, then, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't going to be judged favorably against the other dogs that he would be showing against, right? Because he wouldn't look like them in that regard. Um, And so they wanted to stop showing him and the breeder was adamant that they had to keep, you know, allowing her to drag this dog to shows. I don't know if she needed to build points or um, what the deal was, but and that was what the dispute was over. So if you have something like a co-ownership contract that's going to require you to show the dog, you may want to have some kind of limits or, you know, at a minimum, put in there something that says as mutually agreed so that if it is no longer mutually agreed, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I think the thing was, I don't think these people minded making their dog available necessarily, Um but I think they were on the hook for all the expenses related to showing too. Oh, sure. You know, so yeah. like I almost sold a puppy last year on a co-ownership that we wanted to show. And ultimately what we, we decided not to sell her um, because the people had, I don't know, they had like three different homes in different places and they spent a lot of time in their home up North in Northern Wisconsin and the question was, like, if we want to show this puppy, is she really going to be available to us? And, the, oh, well, we come down to Madison at least once a week. Well, <laughs> but you're also, you know, they were, they were like, well, if, if, if the puppy is, if it's not adversely affecting her, that'll be fine or something like that. And so ultimately, we just got the impression that, you know, they obviously weren't committed to showing her, which is fine because that was our interest. Mm-hmm. Um, but we just knew like the minute the puppy left our house, she was going to leave our control. And unless we wanted to like sue these people over the right to show our puppy, which obviously wasn't feasible, um, it just wasn't going to be a good arrangement. We weren't going to end up getting what we wanted out of it. So I think you have to really think, you know, and that's from the seller side, but as a buyer, you have to really think like, what do I want out of this? And, and what does the other party want out of this? And are we being clear enough about the parameters so that if it's my puppy and I'm, you know, it lives with me, if you want to show it as the breeder, do I have to drive the puppy five hours each way to the dog show or are you going to pick it up and drop it off at my location? And if the puppy isn't finished its championship by age three, do you still have the right to, you know, to make me drive the puppy five hours to the show location every weekend? Right. <clears throat> Because I think those are the devil is in the details, and those are the kind of details that really um, create problems. Yeah. So you got me thinking on the on the dog food thing, actually. So health guarantees, and 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 I I do put in our contracts of we we feed and recommend peering a pro plan, and you know you could have uh, an owner feed, I'm, I, 
obviously I feel like everything else is a lesser quality than pro plan, but <laughs> I'll just sleep in it as a lesser quality food without um, naming brands. But, um, you know, what if they put them on a brand of food that, that does cause growth issues and, um, you ha- start having health issues because of that diet. Yeah. How- I mean, I think that's a great point, right? Cause that would be really hard to pin down. Right. So, if, and I feel like it's very common to say, um, I feel like so many breeders do a health guarantee until the dog is two years old, which is so odd to me because they don't, dogs don't get health tested until they're over two years old, until they're 24, at least 24 months. Right. So you may not know that they're dysplastic until that point, And then you go back to the breeder and they're like, oh, well, I guaranteed it till it was two years old. And now it's 25 months old. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I think that's really tough. I, um, I don't put a health guarantee in my contract. Okay. Okay. Clumbers are like, let's take hips, for example. Clumbers are, um, I don't want to say famously dysplastic, but a lot of clumbers don't pass an OFA screening. And mm-hmm. the more we know about hip dysplasia, the more we know that that can be due to environmental reasons, probably at least as much as genetic reasons. There's no genetic screening for it. Um, and ultimately the evaluation is subjective. And so I don't feel like I have, you know, any way to guarantee that that is going to pass. You know, we have, we have changed breeding practices. You know, we attempt to learn with every litter and we're making changes to try and improve our odds of (laughs) having passing OFA scores. Um, But I don't feel like I can guarantee that. And yeah, if it's environmental factors, it could be food. Um, it could right. be, you know, their traction or their footing that Slippery they're kept floor. on. Yeah, right. hardwood floors. Or being ran hard too early. Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, right. Like what if the owner wants to take the dog jogging? I mean, I tell people a clumber is not the breed for that, but mm-hmm. a Bronco, I mean, they might, right? Mm-hmm. They might jog right. a Bronco. I could see that. Yeah. Um, so... And I know people do, and I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily to put a health guarantee in if you feel comfortable with it. Um, but I just haven't felt comfortable. Um, you know, I, if I were Are you selling- saying that breed specifically, though? Or do you think, like, generally, you, you just wouldn't recommend, you know, agreement or contract-wise to, um, to put a health guarantee on? I mean, I think if, if you have a breed that has a lot of like, again, sticking with hip scores, if you have a breed that has a lot of passing hips, and um, you feel like your dogs always pass their hip screenings, if you feel comfortable with it, I don't think that's a problem. Um, Mm -hmm. And I and and if you breed enough, I mean, that's the other thing is a lot of times a health guarantee might say we'll replace with a similar quality puppy. You know, if you're me, my second litter was five years after my first litter there was no way I'd be able to replace a puppy out of that first litter with another puppy. Right. So you have to take, I think all those things into consideration um, and and then decide what's best for you. And it might boil down to, you know, whether people feel comfortable with your contract without those things. Um, Right. You know, certainly if I bred a dog that had a, I mean, you know, in clumbers, a lot of dogs are radiographically dysplastic but they don't have any clinical, they're not clinically affected. You know, they're fine. Basically they have, they live a good life. But if I bred a dog that was dysplastic and that was severely affected by it, would I feel horrible about that? I would. And would I try to do something to make it right with the buyer if they talk to me about it? Yes, I would, even if there's nothing in the contract. And I Mm -hmm. think that also goes down to, you know, if you're the buyer how much trust do you have in your breeder? Are these people that you can work with, right? And people that you can have a good conversation with and and people that will help you understand what's going on, you know, or people, if they bred a dysplastic dog, like, you know, maybe I can't replace it with another puppy, but can I help these people get more information about the condition? Can I help them get more information about, you know, what treatments we might have used with a dysplastic dog or other people in the breed and how they can really help that dog live its best life. You know, I can do all that regardless of what's in my contract. And I should, frankly. Right. 
Right. I just, I, I guess I'm just asking it because there's just so many different environmental factors, you know, regardless of whether you're, you know, you're breeding a healthy breed or not. There's so yeah. many things in that first two years that could happen environmentally that wouldn't be the cause genetically right. that it, those issues occurred. But I feel like the general public is knowledgeable enough, at least I, with the inquiries I get, uh, people do ask, what is your health guarantee? So that is something they're looking for. That's something that they want to see and read. And, um, but I, I just think too often, I don't know, it just seems like um, rhetor- rhetorical, maybe that's the word for it, where the ones that are putting guarantees are saying it's only till they're two years old. Right. And, um, but so much can happen even be- until they get two years old. Yeah. I mean, you know, to me, that's where some real education comes in. I mean, I do have people ask us, you know, well, what are the health conditions that can come up in a clumber and what are you personally doing to try and, you know, make sure that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I do, I do my best to educate people and say, you know, I, I don't feel like I can guarantee that they're going to have good hips. I can guarantee that, you know, at least one of the parents will have a passing hip score right? And I can guarantee that we will do X, Y, and Z to try and give them a good start in life so that they will have a better chance of not developing this condition. Um, And I think a lot of people, you know, if you engage with them, will understand that. But there are a lot of people who may think that's not the same as having having it in their contract. And and some people might feel only comfortable with that. So then you have to decide if you want to work with them. (laughs) And something, a a feedback I get from um, some of our, on our contract, we have in there that when we sell a puppy, we microchip all of them Mm -hmm. and we put the primary contact in our name and the secondary in the new owner's name. And they don't like that. And right when, when we get the call and we call them, (laughs) <laughs> to say your dog has just shown up here, they get embarrassed and they feel bad. So it's it's not a fun thing and it's happened. But at the same time, we do it because if that dog is found or if it's dropped on the side of the road, who who gets that call? It's always right. just the primary person. If if they get a hold of that primary person first, they don't make the secondary phone call. Right. So right. Our, the dog we bred could be put into a humane society or a rescue and we would never find out about it. Right. So, <laughs> I mean, what's, what's your feelings on that? I mean, I think that that's a, a perfectly fine way to go is to have that in, in your contract. And I mean, it is a contract. So mm-hmm. it's essentially whatever the parties agree to. Um, and I get it. Yeah, people are going to be embarrassed. I mean, our, the first... Well, not the first clumber we bought, our second clumber, which was Wooster, the hunting dog that I was talking about earlier. Um, he was already microchipped when we got him. He was three. We didn't get him as a puppy. And um, the microchip always stayed in the name of the seller. And I always was, I would always joke like, oh boy, I hope never nothing ever happens to Wooster because I really hate to have Jenny call me up and be like, what are you guys doing? We, you lost my dog. Are you kidding me? (laughs) You know, so I would have been very embarrassed, although, you know, maybe that's an additional factor for some people in helping them keep it together and keep track of their dog. I don't know. You, you'd hope not. Right. Um, right. But, but I think also that's another thing you can use as a preservation breeder um, to, to build the relationship with the buyer and say, look, we're doing this because we care about the dog. And we want to make sure that if this dog ever gets lost, that either, you know, we can help get him back to you or, you know, if, if let's say, God forbid, you were killed in a horrible car accident and your dog runs off, you know, as a result um, that, you know, we could find another home for it or, or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. And I think people might be receptive to that. Not everybody, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, then that's a case of, the right buyers and sellers kind of have to find each other, right. To make sure that their requirements, their expectations are similar. And sometimes that's a process. So, 
Yeah, I think it's perfectly fine to put that in your contract. And I think it's a, you know, great idea to chip all the puppies before they leave. That's what we've always done so far. Mm -hmm. And it's, like I said earlier, it's just one of those things where I've had to learn, learn the hard way by it, that we had to do it that way. We've had, we've had it happen twice where we got the phone call from the Humane Society of, we have your dog. And then when I contacted um, those two owners there, but yeah, I'm like, everything okay the dog's here and uh the one girl had been out to dinner that night knowing the dog dropped the fence and then the other oh. owner was like oh well we're actually getting ready to move I had a change in jobs and it's just not going to work out oh, <laughs> and so you're like yeah I mean so I was able to work it out where I got the dogs back from you know the main society but I, I think it's an embarrassing thing for them to come back to a breeder sometimes and say you know, I know I promised you all these things and a good home and I'd have it forever, but it now is just not a good time. And it's easier yep. for them just to go that other route than to have to make that phone call to you. Yep. Yeah. So yet another reason why it's important for you to be the first contact on that chip then. Right. Yep. Right. I think that's very good. Very good observation. It sucks, but um, I mean, and <laughs> I know when I had, when we had to do change of address, when we moved last year, I called a KC reunite to change the ad. I'm like, how do I change the addresses on all these dogs we've bred in the last 13 years? And she's like, Oh wow. That is a lot. Are those, are those all yours? And I told her <laughs> we did. So she didn't think we had 50 yeah. dogs in our right, name. Or right. whatever. <laughs> well, I think that's another thing you can point to people though, too, is like, if you have a microchip, it's really only effective if you keep the contact information current. Right. So if you move, puppy buyer, that might Mm -hmm. slip your mind. If I move, that's top of mind for me because that's every dog I've ever bred that's going to be related to that. So I think that's yet another point. You know, you can tell people like, Hey, um, (laughs) I'm going to definitely make sure if I move or my contact information changes that I change that with AKC reunite. And I think, you know, like someone's going to change their mailing address, but they might not think to change their dog's microchip contact. So I think that's a great point. Yeah. And actually just a month ago, um, two Cocker Spaniels showed up in our yard and we have a microchip scanner here. So I Mm. scanned them right away and the one was chipped and it was um, from Nevada. And so I called AKC and I said, this is the chip I have. And they said that she, it was in Nevada, um, and so there was no updated phone number. I tried the what we tried the one that was on there, and so I did a local post on a um, website that our community around here gets on. And someone said, "Oh, our new neighbors just moved here from Nevada." Oh. <laughs> so, so it ended up being theirs, and the and it was a bitch that had a four week old litter of puppies on the ground that she had ran away from. Yeah. And, uh, but the, when the owners came to pick her up, they didn't even know she was microchipped. Oh, wow. So (laughs) yeah, things could have got real bad there real quick, but, um, Mm -hmm. yeah, microchip, I guess that's a good lesson learned in the last 20 minutes here. (laughs) Uh, Well, I, like I say, we've, we've chipped all of our puppies before they, yeah. And I just, you know, because otherwise, obviously that owner, wouldn't have chipped their dog, right? Because they didn't even mm-hmm. know it was done. So they hadn't done it again themselves. So in order to make sure they're all done, we just do it. Um, and it adds a little cost, you know, right to the cost of the litter, but it's just, that's the cost of doing business. We want it done. Right. And being a responsible breeder, I think, in exactly. general. Where was it? Oh, a, a guardian contract. Mm. Um, what, what is that? Like, that seems to be a new thing that people are talking about right now. And do you think, or how important do you think that they are? I see that term used on some Facebook lists. That's where I've seen it. Um, I haven't, I wouldn't say I've necessarily seen it used in like the preservation breeder community, um, as much to me, what a guardian breeder contract means essentially is probably a co-ownership where, you're buying a bitch, you're going to send it back to the breeder eventually to breed. And um, the litter is going to be owned by the breeder. Uh, I think that's what people are talking about. And I don't necessarily, um, I don't necessarily have an issue 
with it. I mean, right? Like that's a pretty common arrangement in preservation breeding circles. I just don't think that we use that term guardian contract. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I had, I had seen it and I'd never heard of it. I think that's what people are talking about. Yeah. Okay. So is that's not anything to do then with uh, like leaving a dog in your will and who it should go to. Like, so as a breeder, you know, in mm-hmm. our contract, we want everything to come back to us. If for any reason at all, whatever we want it back. And yeah. I think sometimes that's missed when you have an owner pass away and family members then will will take the dog, um, which I can't say I would say, no, you can't have the dog. You know, I, I think by all means, it's always best to keep them in the family if that's where they're going to be known and what, you know, and loved and taken care of. Right. But what are your thoughts on that, putting something in, or how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I've done a whole lot of um, speaking and writing on estate planning and the importance of estate planning when you have pets. Um, okay. I, I do think it's very important because it's, it happens far too often. You know, that's another reason dogs could end up at the Humane Society or you see on Facebook all the time, like my dad just died and he had two bonded, you know, insert name of breed here and now they have to be placed together. And it's clear that these people never are checking with the breeder. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, that isn't something I've put in our contracts so far. And I can't tell you whether I think that it would hold up in a probate court. Um, But I, I don't think it would be the worst idea. I certainly think you should be talking to buyers about that particularly. And we did talk to that uh, to one person we sold a puppy to that was a single guy. We did talk to him about that because he really didn't have uh, much of a fallback, you know, if anything happens to him. Um, you know, I don't worry as much with, I don't know, younger couples or things like that, but things do happen. So I don't think it would be the worst idea to have something in your contract saying, you know, your will will contain or your estate planning documents will contain X provision and the upon or even upon your death, you know, ownership of the dog will revert to me and your personal representative or executor, whatever it's called in your jurisdiction, um, will return the dog promptly. I I, I mean, I I guess that's, unbelievably, this is the first time I've really considered that specific question, Um, even though I've done a lot of talking about the importance of estate planning. um, I guess I haven't necessarily put the two together in that specific way, but I don't think it would be the worst idea. I can't guarantee it would be enforceable. Um, Yeah. But at a minimum, you should talk to people and especially if there's anybody, you know, if you're selling a dog to an older person, you know, I do know a breeder that sold a dog to an older person. She had a good friend that lost her dog and wanted another dog. And they have an agreement that the dog will come back to the breeder. Um, if, if she gets to the point where she can't handle the dog or if she passes away. So I don't think that that's unreasonable in any, in any way. I think it's a good mm-hmm. idea. Do you think that sometimes contracts, you know, we we're going through this and being like, well, you know, we should address this thing and this thing. And do you think sometimes there can just be too much that actually causes more damage than good? Yep. I mean, you know, if you're putting in your contracts that you must feed this food that I sell you, (laughs) um, (laughs) you know, that's an extreme example, but I think there can be. You know, I think there are things that are appropriate to put in a contract, and I think there are things that are appropriate to put in um, an addendum or just in your puppy packet or to just talk to people about, um, you know, things like, um, well, the sire, like, okay, here's the breed standard. Here's the weight range that's given in the breed standard. The sire and dam are, let's say, at the lower end of that range, so if this puppy grows up to be reasonably the similar frame with the parents, this is a weight range I would expect would be appropriate for this puppy. I wouldn't put that in your contract, but I think these are things you can have a discussion about. So I think it's appropriate to put those kind of general care things. You know, if you want to get much beyond like the buyer shall um, provide the puppy with adequate exercise, nutrition, and vet care, in addition to, you know, loving companionship, something general like that, 
if you want to get much beyond that, I think that's more appropriate for the puppy packet than it is for the contract. Okay. And I can see where those things might cause, you know, sort of some potential for conflict. Right. The easiest arrangement I've had is with a friend of ours where, you know, he just, he provides a great home, loves his dogs, hunts them. You know, the expenses are ours if we want yep. stuff done with the dog, but um, he doesn't have interest in breeding and we do. So we always give him our best dogs. Right. And, you know, you know, if we just don't have, you can only limit your love to so many dogs of your own. You can, it's true. So, right. I'm, I'm testing that theory, but... <laughs> Always, I'm always testing that. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, we give them our best dogs. And then when it's time to be bred, uh, they come back to us and we just simply pay him a fee for having her or he gets pick puppy from the litter. And then and then we go through that same arrangement with the pick puppy from the litter. And I think that's fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah, just it's so black and home. white and so easy. Yep. Um, you know, but then you, you do the, do so, another agreement with some other friends to try to really put down what every party wants in there. And then <laughs> it just all goes haywire. <laughs> right. And you know, the, the issue, I mean, I, there are a lot of different types of contracts that I do for, you know, business contracts where, um, people don't have so much of their identity wrapped up in what they're doing. You know, it's mm-hmm. just purely a business arrangement. Dog people, I mean, we tend to have a lot of our identity and a lot of emotion tied up in the things that we're doing with these dogs. And right. so I think that's why sometimes these arrangements can can really be hard to manage. And it is a fine line between making sure that you have enough detail in your agreement that everybody understands it and it's clear what the arrangement is and having mm-hmm. so much detail that it just feels onerous to the buyer. And then either they kind of resent it or they just throw their hands up once they get the dog home and go, eh, whatever, you know, and just kind of toss the contract in a drawer and never look at it again. Um, And that's not what you want either. So I think there is a fine line there, but I, I, you know, I, I firmly believe that contracts have a place because as I said, not only, you know, if you're willing, can you enforce it, but also, it does, it does help set those shared expectations. <clears throat> so in general, I think it does a lot more good than harm. Right. And, and I think, you know, a couple of times I've experienced a situation where, um, you know, we all think our dog is the best one out there. So you sell it on a, a breeding restriction and then they they come to the point where they now want to breed from it because it's the best dog they've ever had in their life and they want another right. one just like it. Right. And I mean, I can I'm gonna be completely honest here. I mean, I've even been like, oh gosh, how can I clone my dog? Oh. <laughs> you oh. know, right? Like we my want one just neighbor has a springer and she's a cute little dog and they love her. You know, yeah. it's not the best springer ever, but when you know we were talking to her and Oh yeah. Well, I said, we're, we're, yep, we bred our dog. So she's going to have these puppies on, you know, next week or whatever it was. And she goes, Oh yeah, we've thought about breeding ours. And I was like, well, you know, we had to do a lot of health testing before we did this breeding. We had to show the dog like, cause they're, they didn't obviously get that dog with the expectation that she was going to be a a specimen that was, you know, adequate for, to carry on the breed. Um, Mm -hmm. So I, (laughs) <laughs> and it's not really any of my business, you know, it's not my Springer that I didn't breed it, but I, I kind of said, like, there's a lot more that goes into it than what it looks like on the surface. It's not just a pile of cute puppies. It's, you know, sitting up all night and, you know, sweating that this puppy might not make it. <laughs> there's a lot of heartbreak with it. That's there for sure. Is. Yep. It's enough heartbreak that we've almost gotten out of it several times because it's so hard. Yeah. And you know, and you hear that, oh, I want, I want to have a litter so my children can experience the magic of birth. Well, I can tell you, there's some things that's happened where my, I wish my kids hadn't had that experience. Yep. So (laughs) sure, it's hard. How do you explain that? Oh, I Um, will say, you know, I convinced my parents to have a litter with our Cocker Spaniel when I was in probably sixth grade. mm -hmm. Um, And I was like, you know, there's a Cocker down the street. I see him when we walk. 
<laughs> and our dog went down the street and she came back pregnant and we had eight puppies. But, um, you know, I think that was the early 80s. So the conversation wasn't quite as sophisticated as it is today about, you know, kind mm-hmm. of what's our responsibility. And my parents, I mean, they sold a puppy. This guy came with his kid bought the puppy. And then the next week, the mom returned it because the parents were divorced and the dad had bought this kid a puppy on the weekend and sent it home to his mom's. (laughs) So my parents took the puppy back, Uh, you know, I mean, but, but I think the conversation has progressed since then. And I think people are a lot more understanding, but it's still the ways to go. What, like, what has been one of the most bizarre cases that you've, that you've had come to you? Oh gosh. Um, well, that's a hard question. Um, <laughs> usually the average cases don't get, you know, any, um, sort of airtime, right? Like they just don't come up. Um, yeah. I guess for me, I would say, you know, things like, um, an oops litter, right? Mm-hmm. Um, now that would be covered under a contract, but usually, when you're creating a contract, you're thinking more about a deliberate breeding, I, I would say, and much less about just the fact that accidents happen, um, which obviously that's the argument for um, putting that mandatory spay and neuter provision in, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of, you know, one thing that I see is there could be an oops litter and then um, the breeder is upset, uh, you know, understandably so. And then there's always the question of, was it really an oops litter or, um, you know, were there, you know, what I see all that, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this, not usually in my own practice, but I see like, well, I left my husband at home while I went to such and such event and he let the dogs out together. And I'm like, really? Cause my husband is a lot smarter than that. <laughs> you know, he knows not to let out two dogs together when there's a bitch in season and there's an entail, but that's, that's kind of the stereotypical, I don't know, mm-hmm. weird, weird situation. I, and I do think that um, breeding is whether accidental or deliberate, that is a significant source of friction. You know, like you're saying, everybody thinks that it's the best dog, right? They're having a lot of success yeah. with the show, things like that. And so they just they think it's the best dog ever. And I mean, I thought my first clumber was the best, do- not my first show dog clumber was the best dog ever. And in a lot of ways, he really was. I mean, <laughs> he was a beautiful mm-hmm. dog. He helped us raise our first litter. And in some ways, I'm sad that I don't have semen from him stored. But on the other hand, he just didn't tick enough of the boxes when it came to health clearances. Yeah. And, you know, in a rare breed like this, I'm sure like you have similar issues with some of the dogs you you would raise. We, we kind of have to compromise, right? We can't throw out every dog that doesn't pass every health clearance. But for us, he just didn't tick enough of the boxes. So sure. we decided early on that he wouldn't be bred from. And I, th- you know, you could ask every dog in my house and they're all going to tell you, well, my mom told me I'm the best dog ever. <laughs> because- <laughs> they will, because right. I think we, we all do have the best dog ever. And yeah. it's just, at some point you need to set up, like you said, a checklist. And if it doesn't meet all the check boxes it's not, it just doesn't need to benefit the future of the breed because right. that's ultimately the goal yep. in dog breeding. Yep. Thank you, Jen. This was a, this was a fun and interesting learning conversation here of the different ins and outs of contracts and how it works. And I'm always happy to talk <laughs> and I do, Good. you know, I, I do um, talk to people in different parts of the country, even though I can't draft their contract, but um, okay. You know, I get a lot of people that call me, so I'm okay. always happy to chat. Yeah. Cause you know, like the dog world is essentially smaller, I think in <laughs> some ways than we, than we realize. And then finding a dog savvy lawyer is even a little bit more difficult. How can we find out more about you and what services you have to offer, Jen? Yeah. Um, so I do have uh, a website which is amundsenlaw.com that probably taught, I mean, it's a fairly bare bones. It's not too detailed, but it probably talks a little bit more about my business work. I also okay. have a Facebook page under dog savvy lawyer. Um, and I have a Twitter account that's fairly neglected, but it's also dog savvy lawyer. So Okay. And I'll put those in the show notes too, in case listeners yeah. want to 
click on that and connect with you. Perfect. So, Thanks. Yeah. And we'll have to do a future episode and we can tackle um, maybe stud dogs and bitch contracts. So a couple other topics. And Sounds good. That are necessity. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. I'd love to. All right. Thanks, Jen. Have a good rest of the week. Thank you, Courtney. You too. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Jen Amundsen. Do you have contract questions? Is there a topic of buying or selling that you still have hesitations with? Share this episode and tag me with your main takeaway or lingering question. My guests and I love to hear your feedback. If you're interested in some swag and my favorite gear, be sure to check out thebirddogbabe.com. But most importantly, please support the sponsors and partners of this podcast and the organizations that are working hard to conserve the birds you're chasing after and the public lands in which you hunt.